Good day, Keith Kaiser here with another lesson from God's Word. We're looking at studies in the book of Acts, and today we take up Acts chapter 9 once more, looking at the Lord's dealings with Saul of Tarsus, how he brought him to an end of himself and brought him to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is tremendous grace on the part of God. When we pick up again at verse 4, Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So this is an extraordinary turn of events where Saul had set himself to be the inveterate enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was committed to getting rid of this cult, as he thought of it, that was worshiping Jesus of Nazareth, a mere man, as he thought. But now he found out this is not a mere man. Jesus is Lord. He's God. He's not only the sovereign master and ruler of the universe and the one whom the Father has appointed to be the judge of all the earth, but he is God. He's equal in essence and in all the attributes of God. God the Son, eternally co-equal with Father and Spirit. And if one is to be united to the Father, they have to come through the Son. We have to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, as our Lord explained, that no man knows the Father but the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son reveals him. Now the Son was revealing to Saul who God really is, not the idolatrous conception that Saul always held, not the imperfect understanding, not the mistaken notion that he could work his way into God's favor, and that by persecuting the name of Christ and persecuting the followers of the way that he was somehow earning his way into God's good graces. No, now he found out his whole life had been wrong and he had to convert. There had to be a change, a radical change, so radical that later in his apostleship, his ministry, he would describe it by inspiration of the Spirit of God in 2 Corinthians 5.17 as a new creation. That's how radical this work of salvation is. It's not just being a better you or becoming a little nicer or turning over a new leaf. It is an infusion of new life, what the Bible calls in Titus 3, regeneration, or John 3 describes it as new birth. You must be born again, said the Lord Jesus. And that's how serious this is. The old life is tainted by sin. It's irrevocably marred, and it cannot be remedied. remedied. It cannot be fixed <coughs> or improved. The Lord Jesus condemned sin in the flesh, Romans 8, 3 says. And so everything written over man in Adam, man descended from the first human being, everything in that humanity is called condemned by God. In other words, God has judged it and deemed it to be not up to his standards, not satisfactory, not something he can receive because it is uh, filled with sin. And so God condemns mankind and outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, we human beings are condemned already. In other words, we're already on the broad road that leads to destruction that the Lord spoke about in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7. We're already heading down the road that'll take us to hell until we receive the Lord Jesus. To receive him is to turn from that broad road, that way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. Proverbs 14 and 16 both have that concept. And to turn to the Lord Jesus is to see that we've been wrong and that our works cannot save us, that we cannot uh, make one of our sins disappear, uh, that we have to come to the Lord Jesus because only he, has offered the right sacrifice for sin. Only he is the propitiation for our sins, as 1 John 2 speaks of, and Romans 3 as well. <clears throat> and the Lord Jesus is the one who has offered the right sacrifice, the sacrifice that enables God to be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. In other words, he's fully paid for sin, and yet he lets God come out in mercy and save the sinner who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's necessary. To receive that, we have to repent and believe this good news. We have to turn from ourselves, change our mind about ourselves. We're a sinner. We're condemned justly. God is right. We're wrong. 
and we say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. In your holy way, through your Son, save me, the one who died for my sins, the one who bore them in his own body on the tree, First Peter 2 says, and the one who rose again for my justification. Rose again to show that everything that blocked me from God, everything that alienated me from him and from his life, has now been removed in Christ. And if I'm in Christ, I'm in Christ forever, and I'm accepted in the Beloved One. My position before God is that I'm declared righteous. The Bible calls that being justified. And we are justified by faith. In other words, we reach out our empty, impoverished hand, and we say, Lord, I want to take that free gift. We lean on the Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God, the way an Israelite bringing their lamb as a sacrifice at the Passover would put their hand on the head and identify with that animal, confessing their sin. And they were saying, in essence, this animal is my substitute. This animal stands in my stead. And we sing sometimes, in my place, condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a savior. Well, such is salvation. We have to come by the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other way. He said, I am the way the truth and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me, John 14, 6. And that's open to whosoever will. And that's how the Bible ends in Revelation 22. We get this wonderful gospel invitation saying, whosoever will, let him come and drink of the water of life freely. God doesn't want us to remain condemned. God doesn't want us to be lost and go to hell. He's not willing that any should perish, but desires all to come to repentance. He wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. This is what the Bible teaches us. And the Lord over and over in the scriptures entreats us to be saved. Well, as a pattern of all long suffering is how Paul would later describe it. Back here when he was still called Saul, he said, you know, this is how far God will go to save a person. This is how much he'll put up with someone and wait for them. Look at how... He allowed me to live my injurious life, my life of blaspheming his name by condemning the name of Jesus and by making the saints even blaspheme under torture and by giving my vote when they were put to death and living that kind of life all the while pretending as if I were righteous, thinking I was okay, thinking I was actually earning greater merit in God's sight through this. No, the only way we can have any value and merit uh, for eternal life, let's say, is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, because eternal life is a gift. It's the gift of God by grace. And so it's not by our works. It's not by what we do. It's by what he has done through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus, who offered himself up by the eternal spirit, Hebrews 9, 14 says. So, the Father sent the Son, the Son came in willing obedience and died on the cross for our sins according to the scriptures and the Spirit of God was uh, instrumental in him being offered up there as a sacrifice. And also when the scriptures speak about his resurrection, he spoke about laying down his own life and taking it up again. So the Son used power in the resurrection. But then the scriptures also tell us that God has raised him up and made him both Lord and Christ. So the Father raised him up. And we read about the resurrection in Romans 4. And it says that it's by the spirit of holiness. So the Holy Spirit is the one also involved in that. The triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Involved in the death and resurrection of the Lord. To bring us an eternal salvation that's absolutely secure in them. Now, when God addresses Saul here, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he asked the question, who are you, Lord? He was no dumb man, you know. He was a well-educated man, had the best education that he could get in those days. Now, both from the Jewish, <coughs> excuse me, the Jewish community, he had studied under their top theologian, Gamaliel, and also apparently had some level of Greek education because he was well acquainted with the Greek classics and could quote them in passages like Acts 17 and also in Titus chapter 1. And so uh, this was a well-educated man, and it didn't take a Ph.D. to tell when there was a great light above the brightness of the sun 
and a voice from heaven speaking, This must be God. So he asked the question, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Well, imagine his uh, shock, his awe, his surprise that the Lord was the Lord Jesus, that Jesus was Lord all along, that everything he thought about Jesus had been wrong all his life. He thought this man, or at least as, as far as he had heard about Jesus of Nazareth, it was wrong. For years he had thought, this is a blasphemer, this is a false man, this man's no good. Those who claim to follow him, they're wrong. And yet now he saw, no, he is who he claimed to be. He's God. He's obviously risen. He's in glory. And so the next question is, Lord, what would you have me to do? And really someone has said that we could write that over the book of Ephesians, that the first three chapters answer the question, who art thou, Lord? And chapters four through six answer the question, what would you have me to do? It's a little bit simplistic, but it's not a bad way to remember uh, some of the divisions of subject matter in the book of Ephesians. Nonetheless, it's a logical step here. You know, too many people say, oh, well, I know about Jesus. Yes, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus was God who became incarnate. He became a baby. He was virgin born at Bethlehem. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for the sins of the world. He rose again. Many people know that and would recite creeds and confess that in one way or another. But do they know the Lord personally? And have they submitted their will to him in the sense that they say, my life isn't mine anymore. I'm going to do what the Lord wants me to do. I'm coming to the Lord to be saved. And I exchange my old life for the new one he gives. He gives me eternal life in his grace. I don't have to earn it. I just have to come and trust in him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I come as a repentant sinner, seeing that I'm bankrupt, seeing that my whole life before Christ has been uh, nothing but vanity and that it can't avail to wash away my sins or to give me a righteous standing in God's sight, that God can't forgive me based on my works. My works can only condemn me because even the good works I've done are marred by self-interest and sin. But when I come to the Lord Jesus, I say, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. It's not what I've done, it's what the Lord Jesus did for me. The Lord Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And that's salvation. And then when we're saved, we say, Lord, what would you have me to do? What would you like me to do? Well, the first thing he had to do, uh, now being a believer in Christ, was he had to be led into the city of Damascus because he was blinded by the light. And he was there uh, left and praying. And God, as we'll see, spoke to one of his servants, a man called Ananias, not to be confused with the earlier Ananias, whom the Lord struck dead in judgment back in chapter 5. But this Ananias was a believer in Syria at Damascus there, and the Lord instructs him to go to Saul. And Saul's going to be baptized. You know, that's the order of Scripture. It's not be baptized and then believe. Or it's not somehow that baptism makes you capable of believing, or baptism gives you eternal life. The Bible doesn't teach that at all. The order is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and then show that before the universe by being baptized. Declare what has happened to you, that you died with Christ, you were buried with him, and you rose again to walk in newness of life. That's the imagery of baptism, <clears throat> excuse me, the symbolism Romans chapter 6 would explain that to us. And the Christians preached that. They preached, believe on the Lord Jesus, and then they taught to be baptized to show that. So we'll see that Saul was obedient in this. He would later be called Paul, and this was his life. <coughs> Excuse me. A life of faith and obedience. A life of believing the Lord. It wasn't just that he believed in the Lord on that one day, at that point in time on the road to Damascus, and he didn't believe in the Lord thereafter. No, the Christian life is one of continual belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, we begin to trust the moment we put our faith in the Lord Jesus for salvation. But our walk 
before the Lord in this world is to be a walk of faith. As Second Corinthians 5, Paul would put it this way, for we walk by faith and not by sight. It's a continual trusting in the Lord Jesus. And we, of course, have to be instructed and taught and to grow in him. But by his spirit and the holy scriptures, God does that and builds us up in Christ and augments our faith that we might serve him and become what he wants us to be, more and more being conformed to the image of his son till he completes that great work on the day when the Lord Jesus descends to receive us to himself. Well, thanks be to God for his wonderful work of salvation. And if you don't know him, friend, there's judgment. There's a hell to be shunned as well as a heaven to be gained. And you don't want to find yourself in the lake of fire for eternity. That was prepared for Satan as angels. God never wanted human beings to be there. But if they refuse the Lord Jesus, if they turn their back on God's light and his salvation through grace by faith, then God has nothing left for them than judgment. And so don't be caught up with that. Be saved. Come to the Lord Jesus today. Thank you for listening.